participants here and so before we begin I'd like to give a quick introduction of everybody joining us today so first we have I'd like to introduce Nguyen Huang Man he is the principal architect of Mia Design Studio hello hello so good the afternoon. company good afternoon the company was born in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam in 2003 the team of architects and designers with great admirers of the modern or with great admirers of the modernist movement seeks to fulfill the difficult task of rethinking and giving continuity to, a, to this iconic generation the projects of mia design studio are valued for their formal simplicity integration of interior and exterior into fluid spaces with special attention to landscape and climate conditions of each project Mia Design Studio seeks to minimize the negative environmental impact of buildings by efficiency and moderation in the use of materials, energy, and development space. Sustainable di design uses, a conscious approach to energy, and ecological conservation in the design of the build building environment. Welcome to Anthology. Um, Welcome back. Next, I would like to introduce Jason Hilgefort. Jason is an architect who studied at the university, urbanist and architect who studied at the University of British Columbia, University of Cincinnati, and is currently a PhD candidate at RMIT. He founded Land Plus Civilization Compositions, a Rotterdam, Hong Kong based studio exploring issues at the ever expanding edge of urbanism that views city creation as an art forum. He recently co-founded the Institute for Autonomous Urbanism, which is focused on how the disruptive developments of this first infrastructure frame a moment in time where we can fundamentally reconceive of how we make, fund, and even conceptualize the world that surrounds us. Next, we have Joel Luna. Joel Luna is the founder of JLPD, a master planning and design practice. He specializes in the planning of large-scale mixed-use townships, community planning, tourism estates, and urban placemaking. And uh, while waiting for other um, participants, I'd like to introduce two of our blind reactors, our two blind reactors. First, we have Ms. Judith. And with Ms. Judith um, Torres, we have jo John Ernest Jose. So, Ms. Judith Torres and John Ernest Jose are from Canto.com.ph. Canto started out as a one-man passion project in 2015 and has since grown into a five-year-old creative title that touches on all aspects of life of modern creative. We aspire, the group aspires to highlight creative voices around the globe in need of a stage and to provide a venue for, for discourse on issues and themes that affect the creative professional. So, welcome. Hi. Welcome. We Hello. Also, Thank we you also for having have, us. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. We also have Florian Heinzelman of Shao Architects. Florian is an architect, designer, parametric design, and building technology expert with focus on daylight. In 2009, together with Daliana Suryawinata and Tobias Hoffman, he founded Shao, an architecture and urbanism office. He is currently a lecturer at National University of Singapore, and together with a team from Shao, won the Arc Daily Building of the Year in 2021 award in the category Public and Landscape Architecture. So, <laughs> Congratulations. Congrats. And um, so we have with us now part of our panelists is group of panelists is um Denise De Castro. Hi then. Hello. Hi Denise. Hi. So Denise, Hello. Denise De Castro is the principal architect of DECA Design Collaborative Architectural Studio. She has a master's degree of architecture from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design and a bachelor's degree from 
Wellesley College. She has worked in design offices in the US and in the Philippines, notably IDEO in San Francisco, CBT Architects in Boston, and Laura Kalma Design Associates, Manila. Here, uh, she leads a very passionate and talented team. And um, last but not the least, we have back with us from the from day, day one, one anthology talks. Anthology talks, Mar Martin De Goose. So, um, for those who um haven't uh, who wasn't able to catch his talk, Martin, um, joined us earlier at day one, and he is an award-winning Beijing-based Dutch architect. So he's mm -hmm. now been based in China since 2010, and is a co-founder of My Son H. Welcome back. Welcome. Han is also somewhere on the way to here. Yeah. Hi, Martin. Hello, Hi, Jason. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Finally got to see Jason and man. <laughs> Hello, my time who covered. Good, good. Look, so many Dutch speaking people here. Yeah, a lot of Dutch background here. We're <laughs> cool back. All right, to start, uh, I think since we had this one year, almost one year, one year of lockdown of this pandemic, what are the changes happening in your cities today? What do you think are the changes happening in your cities today? Uh, we can start with uh, Martin, since you already uh, talked about your place uh, last Friday. I thought uh, because I joined last, I will be asked last, so okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. The change is happening in our city. You know, I thought about this uh, because you sent the questions. I think one of the most apparent changes that I see in the cities here is that they're no longer expanding by means of making new buildings. So there is much more happening to reuse um, existing buildings, old buildings, or uh, leftover areas that used to be ignored or neglected uh, and now seem to be possible to add value to the city. I see that happening a lot, whether it's leftover urban spaces or old dilapidated buildings that are being reused and refurbished. So I think that's a big change in terms of how I think people see the city because it's no longer about just expanding new, 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 but it's about revaluing what has been in your city and repurposing things that didn't seem so promising at first. And that's what I see happening here. Actually, it shows to a lot of uh, what marketing uh, projects are. And it's not just the heritage buildings that are now repurposed, being yeah. uh, reused adaptively. Actually, we have a lot of that here in Manila, um, like the Sequia apartments and a lot of the other buildings in Manila City. Um, Joel Lunas, maybe you could um, share with us what you think of our changing city. Uh, of course, the, uh, the COVID pandemic sort of awakened us to a lot of the deficiencies in, uh, in our city, in Metro Manila. And even pre-pandemic, we've been experiencing this, but I guess uh, the pandemic highlighted it more. So things like mobility, how to move around, especially in a situation where in public transport was constrained because of, of the lockdown. So moving on foot or by bike, and uh, we realized that our, our city was not designed to, to make it friendly for pedestrians as well as for cyclists. So that became very apparent. Uh, also open space, and we, we've experienced that, uh, I guess, not, not, not uniquely to Metro Manila, but uh, in many cities, all of a sudden you value the outdoor space. And uh, one thing that, uh, you know, sort of governed our, our planning philosophy for so many years is we aspire to create cities wherein people prefer to be outdoors rather than indoors. So that's something that we aspire to do. Now, uh, because of the pandemic, it's, it's more of a necessity. You, you now to create that environment that allow people to be outdoors. Now, now sadly, uh, outdoor space is not uniformly distributed to all people in the metropolis. So that's also one, one realization. So 
more marginalized groups have less access to this very important uh, space that is very necessary in times of crisis. Uh, the more affluent sectors of our society have that privilege of having a private open space. Uh, but, but again, this, this also highlights a, uh, uh, call it a spatial inequality in, uh, in the case of Metro Manila specifically. So I guess those two items are, are, are quite top of mind. Let's hear from Denise. What are your thoughts for, about our changing cities? Did you address? I didn't hear it. I don't know about other people. Did you address someone? Sorry. Denise. Denise. I address you. You go. Me? Sure. Yes. I guess I did. I guess I did just volunteer by doing that. Sorry. Um, well, the question is if it's about our city or cities, uh, not in Hong Kong where I'm currently sitting, but what I find uh, interesting in other places, uh, mostly from my reference in the Americas and in the European cities, is this blending of indoor and outdoor, suddenly restaurants having the right to take over parking spots and sidewalks and governments closing streets and starting to have discussions about how that might be become a more permanent idea. And so again, I think it's not just about taking back public space for private, but kind of a blurring what is the commons. Here in Hong Kong, <clears throat> a thing that's been interesting, because unfortunately our government in Hong Kong hasn't done any of that, despite the restaurant industry being devastated uh, by things. But uh, a lot of the more urban residents like myself, because <clears throat> Hong Kong has a peripheral edge that's quite rural in character, do exactly what I just did today. Uh, go out to a rural edge and kind of hike around some of these uh, remaining Cantonese villages. And those villagers at first were excited to have some of that tourist dollar, but now there's been a lot of pushback from those villages kind of saying, how come all these people are coming to our communities? So it's heightening this notion of rights to the city and things others have said. And then, yeah, I mean, another reality, of course, is Hong Kong, because I pointed out I'm in Hong Kong, is we're a part of the Pearl River Delta, but the reality of our borders or the porousness that used to be seen, depending on your visa or your things like this, get really layered. Not to mention now, depending on which uh, jab you got, who's going to be able to cross borders. So even an idealistic version uh, by a lot of people here, including myself, talking about the mega region that is the Pearl River Delta or the Greater Bay Area, you start to be reminded that these imaginary borders have very real consequences going forward in terms of mobility. Let's hear from Denise. Actually, I'm really optimistic to see how uh, cities are changing. Our city is going to change after this. Um, I think everyone's uh, needs for open space, as, as was talked about yesterday and then some of the speakers now, um, is really heightened, uh, as well as uh, food supply, I think. So there's also that tied into uh, open spaces, green open spaces, but also urban farming. Um, so I think that um, will also help improve uh, as well as mobility, which many people have already talked about. Um, now, people are looking again at walking as a basic means of transportation. Um, I think that is really important, bicycling um, and moving away from like a car-centric culture. And I think this is a positive thing so that we can really start to look at our um, city more in, as uh, livable communities, that are pedestrian, mixed use, um, and not far from where we live. And obviously we're working where we live now, but as things slowly become, um, go back to normal, I think this might be more of the norm. People are gonna look to um, live in their pocket communities and generate uh, opportunities in, in those uh, areas. So there's, I think I'm very optimistic about the small changes that are happening. Hopefully they can translate into legislation um, and then filter into um, the developments um, that are happening or will be planned by, by uh, private developers. And uh, I'm really hoping that we will learn from this crisis and make the best out of the opportunities given here. Uh, thanks, Denise. Uh, let's hear from Man. 
Hi, man. Hey, hello, everyone. I'm uh, man from Vietnam. Uh, we don't actually, we are lucky. We don't know much about uh, the effect of uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, so we had more than 90 million inhabitants in Vietnam, uh, but around less than 3,000 persons uh, have been infected by pandemic. So uh, we had three times um, social distancing means we close pubs and uh, bars, karaoke, uh, and so on. Uh, three times. Uh, and then everything today normal again because uh, we, on, on the other hand, we very close, uh, we had very long uh, border with China, uh, but at the same time, uh, we, uh, our government control everything so well in border. Uh, we, we uh, I mean, uh, people in and out of the country, uh, we check and we, um, separate them in 14 days. So uh, it seemed to be I did learn much about uh, uh, our own context uh, with COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, otherwise, um, lucky that uh, I taught for my architecture design in already different way. In the other context of the city, um, in terms of due to we uh, lack of open space already, <laughs> right now uh, numbers of the square meter open space is uh, very rare, I think, compared with the other countries. Um, so therefore, as an architect, we think in a small scale how to bring uh, to keep the balance between the open space in a particular individual house uh, or residential. And then uh, by that way, already give the people a little bit of positive, uh, 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 I mean, uh, life in terms of natural, green, waters, I mean, landscape uh, integrate into the building. So it might have a little bit, but uh, otherwise I don't have much thing to say. Yeah. Um, Ms. Judith, do you have any reactions with Florian? Where's government? <laughs> uh, where's big business? Where I've been here yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> No, so. no, it's almost futile to be talking about, ooh, what? Uh, spatial inequality, uh, urban farming and, and all of that. Mobility, hello, transportation. Where's government? And since we can't really rely on government, where's big business? There. That's my reaction. Or better yet, provocations? Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. Can, can I provoke a little bit here? Yeah, can I start first, provoking? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, find, I find it very interesting uh, looking around here at uh, what sort of people we have. We have background in the Netherlands. We have uh, Vietnam, the Philippines, obviously. Me with my experience in Indonesia. Um, and uh, yeah, Hong Kong, China. And uh, Jason already mentioned it with the deltas, and I find this is a very, very interesting discussion, and I think we should steer this a little bit into that direction. First of all, because when I look at the panelists, um, everybody in a way here who is speaking today has a sort of biophilic, if not biocentric, um, background in, in their designs. Um, so um, there is this, this, this call back to nature. Then, of course, I mean, what, what Martijn uh, mentioned is what happens a lot in Europe is sort of a refurbishment, but I don't see that so much here in Asia and Asia, or especially in the develop or developing countries like uh, probably the Philippines and Indonesia is still about building a lot of new stuff. So having moved to Singapore um, two months ago, um, 
you know, it's a city in the water with a lot of reclamation happening in the 60s. So uh, we have the giant seawall um, proposal for Jakarta to protect Jakarta from flooding. And of course, this project should be financed by land reclamation. And uh, since we have William T here, who uh, recently proposed um, yeah, Horizon Manila, which is actually, must say, a very surprising fast track thing, because if you think about it, it was initiated in 2017, uh, 2020, he won the competition, uh, and 2021, they want to dredge in, um, what is this thing called, shoal, uh, something. But I mean, we have similar things going on, like I said, in Jakarta, and in Penang, we have recently big and sponsored. So, and Jason, you too. Anyway, so um, yeah, I would like to hear, of course, there is an enormous pressure on cities and people migrating. And of course, this pressure in the Southeast Asian region is much different than uh, it is in Europe and the need for growth. But um, now I would like somebody, for instance, like uh, Joel, um, if you would like to react on it, because I looked at your homepage, and I find it quite interesting that you have a proposal for Manila 2060, where you propose food production, uh, garbage waste management, all in the floating city, um, versus a proposal, maybe a little bit more developer-driven, developer-friendly, uh, dredging, and maybe sort of impacting a little bit the maritime, marina life, uh, animal <laughs> life in, 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 the mar in, in the bay. So maybe you could uh, yeah. well, say, what do you think about something like that? Yeah, How do you see oh, oh, it? yeah. well, that, that uh, it, it's really an idea. It's a, it's a concept that we had uh, for, uh, for Manila Bay. Uh, our team sort of uh, pushed that uh, idea forward. Um, uh, the reality is it's, an, it's a response to a lot of mega trends, as we may call it, uh, that's influencing uh, Manila. We're not saying that that is the most feasible solution, but we were hoping it would address certain things. Now, what are those uh, mega trends? And you know, we're talking about COVID, but that COVID is one instance. The the larger trends that are impacting urbanization in general will remain. Uh, like, for instance, demographics. Uh, we're, we're all aware of uh, uh, the movement of people towards cities. Let's say if we take uh, 2050, Metro Manila is projected to have a population of 23 million. That's 9 million more than what we have now, <laughs> right? Uh, the Philippine, uh, total Philippine population will be about 150 million. And two thirds of that, Right now, only uh, only about 50% of uh, Philippine population is urban. The projection is by 2050, uh, two thirds of 150 million people will be living in our cities. And we can already imagine that most of them will be in Metro Manila. Uh, so, so 23 million people in, in Metro Manila, can you imagine that? So the scarcity of land, the impact of, of something like that, mega trend, uh, the demographic implication of that on impacts on mobility. If uh, you know pre-pandemic we were already struggling with uh, mobility in Metro Manila, what more if you add uh, uh, nine more million people there? And that's nighttime population, by the way. It's not even daytime population. So you can imagine that the daytime population will be even more. So, so we can sort of imagine what what would potentially happen to the movement of goods and people and ideas. Uh, cities, of course, uh, tend to attract people. No matter how, you know, the, 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 how, how uh, severe the situation was or is in Metro Manila, uh, people still go to cities. And because we, it's a place to exchange goods and ideas, and, and, and that's what cities do. Uh, so, in the future, I think uh, with all of these ma ma major trends that would still happen, barring any severe shock, we have to think of how the city can, can, can continue to do what it does best, which is the, you know, the concentration of people so that they can generate ideas to make 
everything better for everyone. So that's sort of like the ideal, the ideal situation for, for cities. How do we see this in terms of implementation? I mean, you wrote an article on floodplains and stuff like this, you know, uh -huh. the, the, the soft border between water, uh, 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 yeah. green in, in, in the shoreline, the mangroves and right. so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, a, a impact of something like a completely reclaiming. How, how do you see this or how would yeah. you with it? Well, for that particular uh, idea that we, we proposed, it was really floating, it wasn't reclaimed. And in fact, we, we, we wanted to step lightly on, on the land. Um, given the situation in Manila Bay as it is right now. And uh, we wanted to have a more restorative approach, uh, allow the bay to recover, cleansing the waters through this, uh, gathering the nutrients that come off of uh, the estuaries and the, and the, and the uh, river systems and then it's cleansed. So, you know, uh, taking taking a bit of biomimicry, we want we likened it to a water hyacinth, which cleanses the water, uh, gathers energy from the sun, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, again, it's 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 an idea to bring nature to to cities. So Denise already mentioned there's a problem about food, and we felt that during the pandemic with when with, with the lockdowns and. Uh, food supply chains being hampered. So how do we bring food production closer to the cities? Uh, this one is a, uh, what we propose is probably a bit more extreme, but it's sort of, sometimes you need to show extreme ideas to, to bring home the point, right? So, so yeah, that's... Uh... So I wanna, wanna add something here. Before we all talk about um, impossible scenarios of floating green and beauty and so forth, which is amazing. Uh, however, if we really talk about our changing cities, if you think about it, the problem is our cities have become unlivable, unaffordable, and without hope. Young generations that grow up in cities have no future there. They cannot even put their children out to play because the city is too polluted, too dangerous, they are too far away from any public facility, they need to spend hours in underground subways to go to whatever terrible office building they need to work in, I mean, the problem of our cities is not, I think, uh, a problem of uh, architecture. It is a problem of, um, of, of planning, of space, but it's mostly a problem of people. You know, so I think as we talk government, uh, big business, um, we are in China. I was just talking with Han. You know, we are in, in Beijing, which is the capital of, of China, as you know. I've been here 10 years and the amount of change that I've seen in that 10 years in a positive way is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. When I came here 10 years ago, there was no high speed train, zero. They now have the, the fastest, the largest, the biggest high speed train network that connects to rural undeveloped areas with centers of large economic potential. It's, it's has also the Chinese government, together with businesses, together with institutions, like where I'm teaching in Tsinghua, have been able to lift 300 million people out of poverty. It has increased living standards in city dramatically. It has increased open space. It has increased green space. It has increased infrastructure accessibility. But on top of that, the market has also seen all that potential. So despite all that effort, even though the effort has been extreme and enormous, cities have still become more and more unlivable. You know, it's unaffordable to buy a house here. Like we can't buy a house here and we have a good salary, good income. If we think about moving to Holland, you know, we could, we could buy a house there, I guess we could. But do we want to live there now? You know, the amount of hate between people of different um, social cultural backgrounds in the Netherlands is insane. You know, <laughs> why, you know why, why would you want to live there? And I think that's a big problem. Are cities still really in line with what people need and what people want? I think that's a big, big challenge, I think. So I'm not so concerned about making new beautiful architecture. I'm thinking about how can we help these people in the cities live a better life? Going, um, oh. sure. I think in line with what Martin said, um, since we are operating in a country where it's big government, <laughs> you realize more and more really as architects, 
truly, you know, in terms of what we do, how powerless we really are to affect big change, I think. I think big change, I mean, we have the skills to facilitate big change, but no architects are going to go out there and make big change. The forces, the most important forces in society right now are the government, the general public, big business, in different orders and from different countries, of course. And I think the example you can see here is that, number one, we have big government, but at the same time, the general public is very important in China, despite whatever it is that you read in the papers, because the government make, they make decisions here and they're very informed about what the general public is thinking, what are they dissatisfied with, what are they satisfied with. I mean, it's not to say it's perfect, it's far from perfect, but we see all the time, you know, different policies policies changing really month to month according to what society is dictating at the time and you can see in certain circumstances the effects of good government can be extremely positive for example you know there's a lot of pressure in cities in china as everybody knows you know i would say like five of our top tier cities are all vastly overpopulated very very expensive and like martin said just up really you know the aspirations of living in those cities are, are impossible for the younger generations so the government has gone out and taken a huge effort to kind of develop a second third fourth tier cities and also give funds to the countryside to try to you know revitalize not just the countryside but try to revitalize their natural resources, the local crops, the local produce, in order to not just keep people in the countryside, but attract positive investment in the countryside. So, you know, it's much more about how can we, as architects, make the spaces better in the cities. It has to be done in conjunction with these kind of broader policies that the governments are willing to undertake. And I think, to some degree, it's perhaps means undoubtedly a lot easier when you have big government, but the same kind of efforts are not really seen in many Western governments. I myself, I live most of my life in Australia, so you know, I really can understand both worlds. And if we look at you know, the, the big, the contrast between you know, really what is driving government action in both of these countries, it's so different. Australia is a country that has the highest per capita carbon footprint in the world. It's a vast country, very, very large, very wealthy, where most people actually live in urban centres. It may seem ridiculous to say the urban centres in Australia, a country so, you know, vast with natural resources, are under stress, but they indeed they are. They are definitely under stress because we don't have a lot of inhabitable land in Australia. So everyone has to live in major cities along the coast. And despite the amount of stress these cities have, I myself, I don't really see even anywhere near close to the level of action to try to alleviate these pressures from governments like the, the, the Australian government. Perhaps because, you know, they have a different form of government, but yeah, in both scenarios, architects are definitely not going, to, not going to be the miracle workers. But I think in definitely at least where we are, we see more potential to facilitate the process. Yes. So um, I have a question. Given this realization that like public spaces are really important, especially now, how do we persuade our developers, our clients, to actually create public spaces and not just any public space or open space, but barrier-free public spaces for anybody from any class to, um, to access? So it's, it's really difficult because, you know, there's, you know, everybody always has concerns about being profitable and all that. So anyone can start. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just wanted to jump in and, and talk about um, the countryside and secondary cities. I think that's where we can really find uh, a lot of opportunity, especially here in the Philippines. Um, just myself, we've been working from home for a year, but uh, about a quarter of my team now is spread out. Uh, they're working from north to south of the Philippines, and they've gone home. And 
um, hopefully, um, I think we can continue with this model and then hopefully other um, companies will also do the same so that the uh, this will really generate engines of growth in these secondary cities. And um, instead of creating, you know, um, instead of, of uh, generating more growth in, mega, in Metro Manila as a mega city, these secondary cities can really develop now as an opportunity for them to do that. And uh, I think that's where the, the possibilities for the ch city to change. And as Joel said, you know, we'll be more urbanized, um, you know, in uh, a few years, about two thirds of our population, but hopefully that urbanization will happen in these secondary cities. It's a bit more difficult for us in the Philippines um, to create um, transportation links and infrastructure links because we are an archipelago. Um, but hopefully the investments that the government is doing um, to connect um, cities through uh, bridges, through roads and airports, hopefully this can happen um, in the future. And then we could obviously, from developing these secondary cities uh, at this point, we can already inject these livable uh, components that hopefully we can avoid and not make the same mistakes that um, have happened here in Metro Manila um, and are already happening in some secondary cities like Cebu. So there's still the opportunity, but yes, we need a lot of um, action and big action, right? And uh, big, col big collaboration, basically. Because it can't just happen um, independently from the government or really has to be collaborative effort. I just want to chime so, in to what you were saying, Denise, and what um, Florian was saying and about the equality thing. And I feel like, you know, architects were always talking about developing the countryside, the peri-urban areas, the suburban areas. But that's almost like all of us here living in private cities trying to save people from outside to keep out. You know, we're saying we're going to make your houses better. Don't come in. So yeah, I mean, exactly. that's kind of like this is what I wonder how well it works policy making wise because you right. know like the same happens in, in Indonesia as well. You want to strengthen hinterland. You want to give people reason to stay uh, where they are and not coming to Jakarta to make it uh, worse and worse and worse. And maybe Jakarta is one of the, the worst places. But apparently, it does not seem to work at all. Right? So people are still coming, and um, so. You know what is what do you think is required to make this really successful is it like a it's to require that everybody has equal chances and resources regardless of where they live you know you've been to holland holland is one big countryside we have no mega cities because it doesn't matter where you live your neighborhood school is going to be a great school your neighborhood um, uh, um, hospital is going to be a good hospital anything is available in your own area and I think that's a big, big challenge in um, Southeast and in Eastern Asia because a lot of these resources, just like in Australia, are concentrated only in very few spots. Mm. You know, in China, people come all the way from like um, Xinjiang or Tibet to Beijing to go to the hospital because they, the best hospitals are in Beijing. You know? yeah. So they have now spread out much more branch hospitals of the good universities and of the good uh, health hospitals to other second and third tier cities. So I think through a more equal distribution of these basic resources in uh, you know, good quality, we can make sure that it's not about we're preventing you from coming to the city. We bring the good parts that we have here in the city to you. I think that's very, very important. And, you know, it, I I would think for most countries, I mean, the government can really initiate this kind of effort. Because here, the first step the government did was infrastructure. They built, um, you know, I, I think everyone's read in news, massive infrastructure to make sure that mobility will be improved for everyone in the country, which, you know, makes I guess resources much more equal and available to everybody. You know, they have, um, we have a say, um, it, I think it's a, it's a communist thing here. They call it like moderate prosperity for everybody. Meaning that, you know, that the goal is to have everyone enjoy some kind of moderate level of prosperity. And this means, you know, that they had to provide basic availability of goods and transportation to every household 
whether you're in the city or the countryside, whatever tier city you're in. And that has really, and they work a lot with big business to enable this to happen. For example, they build roads and big business like Alibaba, who have their own logistics system, or it's JD.com, they have to guarantee that if, if the roads are put in there, if the internet is available, they have to be able to deliver them. Because it's not so much about people being able to receive goods. When you make these kind of services available to people in the countryside, you know what, they can start their own business. They can take care of their, take advantage of their local resources. We see so much here. For example, now if I want to buy fruit, because we live in Beijing, so we don't have sources to really fresh fruit, fresh fruit or vegetables. But what you can do is you can go online and you can buy directly from prod, prod producers in the countryside, like very far off from wherever it is produced. And they're able to do that because the government provides the roads and the big business like Alibaba, they provide the platform you know, for these people to go and sell their goods and they provide the logistics, you know, you know they provide the delivery men to go and get the goods and get it onto the market. Things like this are really, really important for the development of countryside and second, third, fourth tier cities. Yeah, right. sure. I mean, look, there are different governments and different political systems, and some are more successful in certain ways than others are. But um, it is not necessarily true for, 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 for all the countries here in Wolf how, how it would work or should work or could work. Um, so I would also like to hear maybe uh, a little bit from, from other people here. Um, how be my their perspective is that? Yeah. I think John was. Oh. Yeah, uh, from um, Vietnam, in the last three years, the government, uh, our government, uh, they make it so difficult for developers uh, to develop, develop uh, a project in uh, the big cities in Vietnam. Uh, so therefore, there is a big competition between developers. They put out uh, in the suburban uh, to make the satellite city. And then um, uh, it's a good news for Vietnam. It's uh, uh, next uh, three, four years to five years, we are going to develop uh, a lot of highways uh, 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 like to connect between the cities. Uh, and the major city. So therefore, uh, developers, uh, they are like uh, in the big, big players in the market. They, they not only develop the house, uh, residential, or they also at the same time, they want their project like a 1,000 hectare uh, per project. So between that, everything's uh, in under the brand, hospital, uh, primary school uh, and high school, and even uh, 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 university. So I'm, I'm uh, quite, think, uh, quite positive about uh, what happened in Vietnam you now for the next five years. Hello. I'd like to uh, add also, uh, for, for regarding the uh, countryside uh, development, and maybe one one thrust, and this is where government intervention or through through its means of incentives and disincentives can can really come in is the idea of localization. So, you know, all over the the Philippines, if you know, we always talk about big business and you know investments from from the big corporations. But if you look at the the Philippine economy, ninety percent is driven by small, medium scale enterprises, and they're of course in all of the towns and cities. So perhaps what what government can do to really incentivize uh, countryside development is uh, you know uh, give give better tax breaks to these small enterprises. Because right now, most of the uh, tax incentives are, are, are given to the big companies, uh, multinational companies. So maybe that's one way of evening out the, the playing field so that these small enterprises can, can attract jobs within that same locality. Uh, hello? 
So I hope you'd allow me to speak as a point of view, as an architect, not as from Kanto. No? So uh, as an architectural part practitioner, uh, we also had uh, medical care facility projects wherein we had to change the way our space programming works. Uh, before uh, before the COVID or before the pandemic at least happened, uh, there was no uh, consideration for separating, for example, the entrance of the suspected COVID pa uh, COVID patients. No? So for now, because of this uh, pandemic, uh, for our hospital projects, uh, we're doing uh, one in Aklan. It's a province in the Philippines. We had to separate a molecular lab, as they call it, molecular lab, wherein all the rapid testing uh, procedures are being done. But because of their uh, uh, potentially, uh, because of their potential uh, contagion, because of the potential contagion, we had to separate or create a separate entrance or building for them. So I guess that's how one of the changes that happened when, uh, when the pandemic struck. Now, uh, just like what uh, architect Joel Luna had said, uh, there is, I think, there is a boom in the businesses, especially in the small, small scale businesses, because um, I have this friend whose private resort uh, greatly bloomed because of the pandemic. So the large public resorts closed down, but there's an enlarged demand for smaller, uh, smaller resorts wherein families of three to five can gather. So a friend of mine said that his business was blooming because uh, people who wanted to go to the beach or, or wanted to have a break, but they can't because the public resorts are closed, uh, they can do it uh, on a smaller scale. No? And, being what, uh, and speaking of smaller scale, no, uh, it's actually based on our culture at least. If you've noticed, uh, it's cheaper to have a wedding right now. Uh, it's because... Uh, there are fewer people, no? so in our culture of this year in the Philippines, the culture calls for lots of people gathering. No? So a wedding would normally had 100, 200, or hundreds of people actually. But because of the pandemic, uh, small scale gatherings have become the norm. So it's just another thing that I've observed. No? It's actually cheaper to have a wedding. But so if you have plans, <laughs> well, I know most of you are already married. So, but I think it's actually the best time to get married right now if you're planning to save on some money. So that's. <laughs> Can I just do um, something? I, I really love what Man um, talked about. I think one of the the first things that we should do, especially in the Philippines, okay. is just really learn from our neighbors. Um, the, such amazing success stories in Vietnam, even in China. We don't have to reinvent the wheel here. I think we just really need to look at our neighbors who are um, have developed from very similar circumstances and improved and created more livable cities. I think that's a great idea. Actually, Man, I'm, I'm very excited to hear that in Vietnam, they are following the similar model as we are here having here in China at the moment. In Beijing, it is not allowed to build new buildings at the moment within the fourth ring road. And uh, last year, a known developer have, has been able to get new land because it is so hard for developers to, to come up with proper proposals to develop them. So they go out to other cities like second, third tier, fourth tier cities. So I think maybe rather than providing tax incentives for for small businesses elsewhere it's also a good idea to just provide regulations in areas where you don't want things and then to say that will make people go out and i know vietnam and china have a similar government uh, uh, model <laughs> yeah and uh, i think i think if i compare i'm from holland uh, han is from australia oh, well she's from here but grew up in australia that, those are very different government models, and Holland has a, a government model where everybody needs to agree on everything, which is very, very slow. However, um, we also have a very kind of science-based uh, city planning. That means if somebody can show, you know, it's this amount, that number, in this time frame, then policies are going to be made towards that. And I've found that in um, some countries that I've visited since, it's mostly driven by finance and money. 
And that's a problem because the current city development is largely driven by, um, by finance and just purely monetary finance. And I can recommend everybody to read this book. It's called The Donut Economy. And it's, um, it's, it's a manifest to reconsider our economic values and include social, cultural, and environmental values inside the economic factors. Because you know, environmental pollution and, and social decay also have an effect on the, on the larger economy. And I think all these questions about how can we help developers make more public space? How can we help? We should not be helping developers. We should make sure that developers understand that it's more than just a model for them to make the most profit for their shareholders, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, think, I think very easy. Uh, our government start very smart, okay? Uh, they say uh, one after days, one after months, they start to announce, oh, there is the highway there coming up. It is yes. the airport there coming out. And then suddenly, the people pulling out and buy the land, uh, yeah. looking for the profit opportunity. So they say, one day slowing now. They say, hmm, that's play not bad. And everything is going to be ready. Everything is good. The environment is good, much better than in a big city. So uh, I think. Uh, for the next five years, uh, our big city is going to change, which is a positive uh, way. So, uh, I don't know uh, um, if economy, you know, the money to build the infrastructures, they compete uh, with big developers, they build. You know, we pay toll, who cares? Yeah. We get a good road, we had a big uh, environment, a living environment. So I, I'm sure with this model of developing of, uh, to, to, to express the minimized uh, uh, congestion in, in the big cities will be uh, effective for Vietnam. That's how I learned. I think it's quite interesting to uh, sort of make a short summary. I mean, we have like maybe it's China and Vietnam on the one hand and uh, other countries like uh, maybe the Philippines and Indonesia on the other. And there's the question, you know, who has who in the hand? And um, it seems like um, on the former example, um, the government has the, the, the developers under control. And in the other one, it's more like the conglomerates have the government under control. And therefore, um, city planning is probably much more um, driven by uh, developer interests than the interest for greater or public greater good. And uh, nonetheless, I mean, um, even though uh, we living in these countries, on the other side of the spectrum, or the other side of, of the metal, we also have to make and improve our cities. Uh, and I would like to hear maybe what uh, what we can do there, or how maybe Denise or uh, Joel um, see maybe that. Jason. <laughs> or Jason, yeah, you haven't said anything for a very long time. You're sort of uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a limbo in between somehow. I'm going to keep away from the Chinese discussion uh, as politely as possible. I have mixed feelings on that as someone who does a lot of projects on the mainland and does live in Hong Kong. <clears throat> and I would say our, um, our economy here is very much profit driven, but very much in control by the government. So kind of a bit of both um, in, in some regards. Um, but I do think we do have to be careful, as you got at, Florian, the reality of the government model. As someone who grew up in the United States, very much capital-driven uh, in terms of things, uh, we have to be careful using examples from places like mainland China or, or the Netherlands that does have an extremely powerful governmental system that can have much more control, which have huge upsides. Um, but the ability of doing things like that in places like the US or some of the other, you know, Indonesia and Philippines is just, at least in my opinion, not realistic uh, as a real model of how things can be. So in terms of what we can do as, as architects, <clears throat> yeah, I totally agree with what was said before about learning from our neighbors, but let's be contextual about what we learn 
and, and what we can get from those things. So I certainly think us architects can be much more savvy about, you know, because even infrastructure was mentioned, uh, the benefit of connecting the countryside in, in some examples, but uh, in Hong Kong, it was really nice to see the protests uh, a year ago uh, acknowledge that the transit system here, MTR, extremely successful, world-renowned example, uh, but a lot of the local citizens quickly realized that was a representation of power and that that maybe dictated how land development happens, how people live their lives, and has a lot of impact. So I think we need to be very savvy about what we advocate in terms of infrastructural systems and how that works. Um, <clears throat> but not just assume um, we're complicit in the answer. I'm not sure I'm giving a coherent answer. I did. I did. I was kind of happy when you were handing it off. As someone speaking in a more Southeast Asian conference, uh, being in Hong Kong uh, and a white guy from rural Ohio, uh, it's always a little. I'd be a little cautious on what I say, but I do think we have a major role, uh, and we have to leverage that power. But it's also within certain bounds, and we have to be careful which references we give our governmental realities, uh, because some of them are just not realistic. I guess that's what I'll try and say, and I'll happily pass it on to what others were suggested before someone pointed out I've been politely kind of quiet. I'm happy to listen. <laughs> well, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just add and uh, just to, uh, no, I appreciate what Martin said about uh, Donut Economics, Kate, Kate Howard's uh, book, because cities are really just a physical manifestation of uh, the, the socioeconomic structure that we built for ourselves, right? So, so uh, we, uh, capitalism is, of course, the, the, the sort of the, uh, what has been the main driving force. And uh, uh, we, we, we talk about developers, uh, 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 prioritizing profit, uh, we cannot fault them for that. that. That's what business does, okay? Uh, markets behave their own way and they will seek opportunity and they will exploit it when they find it, if you leave them alone. Now that's probably where government can come in because you know the government should look after the welfare or, or the public good. So these two have to go hand in hand. Uh, too much regulation can restrict the the uh, uh, the ability of capitalism to optimize so that it can distribute wealth. I mean, it's about wealth generation, right? Now, the other thing is uh, maybe we we have a very limited view of what wealth should be, and that has been the prevailing mindset that has governed uh, you know our social economic structure and therefore our cities. So these, these new ideas of donut economic circular economy, again, we're, we're realizing that it's time has come. Cities have encroached in not just the countryside, but into the natural realm. Where will we get resources to, to continue with this you know, uh, relentless pursuit of growth? <laughs> it cannot be infinite. So, so we now have to take stock and, and find out what where do we derive value? Uh, monetary value is not, cannot be the sole measure of, of value. So we have to sort of realign this whole economic paradigm that we have built because we, we, we're seeing that it is simply insufficient. Well, I'm also hoping, just to jump in, Joel, after you, I think um, with the pandemic and, and the generation that's uh, that's evolving now through this. I think they're learning to live with less, right? And there's hopefully less consumption um, will, will come out of uh, the pandemic and maybe really going back to valuing essentials, like you said, and maybe uh, the, the focus then will be on generating uh, not just not the same kind of wealth, right, or levels of wealth that were previously uh, aspired to, but maybe this will give us a, like a generational change might happen now. And uh, maybe the, this will drive the economies differently. And, um, and now there's also a lot of digital economies happening 
uh, which can also spread the wealth uh, more equally, right? So hopefully, maybe there is something that will come out of this uh, pandemic and, and change the way that um, the cities are, are, are generating uh, economies. And do hope anyone can just chime in. Um, we were asking about your thoughts on gentrification, especially since we're talking about developers and all that, right? But more so, I think going beyond that, I'd like to ask, like, I mean, we're all celebrating a kind of like post-capitalistic world. And so, like, what role, if any, can architecture or architects have? And how do we detach architecture from, of course, you know, um, it's still financially driven primarily. And so, like, maybe thoughts on that. Anyone? That's a tough question, William. <laughs> well, maybe it's more like an evolution of uh, capitalism. You know, we don't really know what the alternative is to capitalism right now. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think the, uh, well, maybe just to that, that idea of gentrification and, and you know, this, we're seeing again the manifestation of, of, of uh, big business as they sort of ease out the more traditional and uh, more affordable types and you know, the low income renters. Uh, so whether it's a redevelopment of a, an old section of a community to give way to you know, the nice, nice buildings uh, and then therefore ease out the older uh, occupants. Uh, or uh, the flip side of that is whenever there's a new development, let's say an infill development in a, in a city, in an older neighborhood, one thing it does also is to create the supply so that uh, it can absorb some of the rent so that the older homes can, be, can, can still provide the more affordable rent. So I, I think in all of these, we have to look at uh, uh, the, the whole ecosystem, the, the whole system of it. So, you know, we, 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 we are concerned about old neighborhoods gentrifying because there's a new development coming in, but what is that really doing in terms of supply and demand? And, you know, it, it's very possible that when a new development com comes in into an old section of town, it's actually preserving the low rent values in the older, uh, in the older housing supply there. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just a more holistic view on the impacts of, of these things. I, I agree on that, um, Joe. I think it, it's not, not so much black and white, and I'm not to say what, what a new model is or should be, but there is um, somebody in, in our chat who's, who's also putting some standpoint forward, which I like to share with all of you, which I, because I think he's very right. I don't know this person, but he says architects are to be involved in neighbors and neighborhoods and city development, not only doing buildings. I think that's a great starting point. You know, what can architects do? They can be, as, as you just mentioned, they be involved in the building of neighborhoods and communities rather than just um, providing the task of um, giving form to the demands of a developer in the form of a, a building. And then the ideological stand standpoint, he mentions, for whom should prevail in this discussion. And I agree with that. Who are we building these buildings for? Who are we making these neighborhoods and cities for? Yeah, are we making them as an investment vehicles or are we making them for people to live in? And uh, again, I, I lived in Holland for the first uh, 21 years of my life. Then I lived in the United States for one year in Los Angeles. You know, for me, I loved it there. It's a beautiful city, the sunshine all the time, you know, there's amazing food, amazing people. But half of the other, the, the city, half of the city is just terrible. You know, so much poverty and homeless people and drugs and crime. And I was so shocked to see that as a person from Holland. I was never, I didn't know that that was a result of capitalist cities, you know, oh my God. And then I moved to China uh, a few years after that. And I saw, I thought China was this horrible, depressing place where the whole population was suppressed. 
that that's what I read. But then I came here and everybody was like really building a country together. And you know, I don't say what what's right or wrong, but the effect that that this kind of um, building together has on both the quality of the environment and the quality of the city is is really large. So then this gentrification is also not happening uh, so quickly because it's a community of people that build together. You know, we are a typical example of a gentrification, right? Because we are more affluent people that come to live in a, in a kind of older um, downtown neighborhood. Uh, and we are just one person, it's not the entire neighborhood. And the, well, we are very nice, we, you know, the local people support us, we support the local people and we form one community rather than that we are, you know, a developer imposing us into this uh, as, a, as a kind of a development model. No. But there are also, I think, more and more developers, look, I can't say this is happening everywhere in the world. Um, I spend most of my working life here, so I can only speak for what is happening here in terms of what the developers are doing in gentrification. Um, because Beijing is a very old city, so obviously gentrification has been happening for a long time now. And the previous models that we have seen, whether it's from private developers or government developers, it's always been gentrifications, basically, we tear everything down and we give you something new. Or we, you know, put a new face on everything and we try to drive the old, some of the old neighborhoods out in, in, in order to clear more space for higher value customers. And what you see more and more now is, um, is it also gentrification and, and, go, and developers taking over old areas and neighborhoods, but they have a new model now. So I think the goal now is, and this might have also have to do with part of our government policies, that if, if a developer has to come in and do whatever is necessary to make profit, they also have to invest a certain amount of public infrastructure and upgrading the existing neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this has been a really positive move and we have seen this happen quite a lot, primarily from government developers, but also from private developers. And together I think, with the yeah, together and they consult with the neighborhoods um, because they are also recognizing more and more that the value and the success of their developments really depend on the support of the local community as well. Because since now we're, Nowadays, they don't just drive them out anymore. They don't have the support of the neighborhood. Development runs into a lot of trouble. So I think, you know, we're seeing a new way of doing things and we hope that this will help, I guess, build a new model for gentrification. Because I think as, you know, was brought forward before, there are many sides of gentrification. It is not always bad. There are also positive side effects, and the reality is, in a lot of cities, the older neighborhoods they they need, you know, I I, I wouldn't always say gentrification, but they need modernization. They 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 do they do need upgrading. I agree. I I, I agree. Uh, thanks, Han, for that. Uh, for our next question is, uh, how can you ask gentrification, as you said, for the gentrification, right? How can we maximize the use of spaces that have been affected by this pandemic and spaces that remain idle for in this pandemic, like you know, such as malls, office buildings, parks, and even schools and stadiums? Jason? Yeah. I think Dennis has or something to, yeah, to say. Yeah, I think I think the name of the game now is just really flexibility, um, adaptability, um, and we see this in, in every typology, right? Whether it's residential, institutional, commercial. Um, so I think for us to survive, uh, for these um, spaces to be used and not be white elephants, we really just need to adapt the uses. Um, like uh, in, basically in, in the U.S. and in some other countries where. Um, their vaccination drives are in full, full force. You know, they're using stadiums as uh, health centers. You know, we could do that here as well, which we did earlier in the pandemic with, you know, with working with Will, we were using um, open spaces uh, as quarantine facilities. So I think it's really having that in mind, 
you know, what can we do um, to co-locate, um, to adapt and be flexible moving forward. And hopefully um, these spaces don't become um, basically un unused um, buildings in our, in our cities become derelict, which you would, you would you know, try to avoid as much as possible. I think there's a big opportunity for uh, streets, and we've seen that uh, because of the pandemic, there's a reduced dependence on the automobile. On street parking, all of those parking spaces on the sides of the streets, and in other countries, we've seen them uh, be become used for alfresco dining or, or parklets. And uh, what we realize is uh, we've been using streets wrong. Uh, it's, it's sort of uh, just uh, allocated exclusively for cars. And what we're seeing is that streets should be for everyone. Uh, it's not even just for mobility. It's part of the open space. In fact, in many uh, local government units, that's the only public asset that they have. Uh, they, they don't own any other property. So maximizing the use of, uh, of streets so that you, you encourage multiple activities for most people, not just cars. I think that's, that's where the opportunity is. I think most of us here, I think most of us here have worked on um, impermanent structures, you know, and Especially Martin, um, you've you've been adapting a lot of like old structures and, and stuff like that. Um, I was just thinking like, if architecture seems to be moving towards a sense of impermanence, where does that leave us? You know, moving forward. I mean, like, you know, is it that all architecture now becomes you know just for the moment? Um, especially now that we're adapting so many buildings, especially because of the pandemic and all these things. And so like. Is that really where architecture will be going? And is that something we want to do as architects? I mean, do we want our architecture to be more for the moment and just, you know, not have that same sense of permanence as our old, you know, institutions and structures used to have? Okay, I, I think two things. One, architecture is not going to be impermanent. We in, in China have not had any temporary COVID things because COVID just really didn't affect um, uh, society much here. It's comparable, I guess, to Man's experience in, in Vietnam, as he just shared before. We had some lockdowns, but very minor, and um, uh, emergency hospitals were in place or set up on the outskirts of cities. So, so that's on, on one part. On the other part, the role of architecture is, is always to respond to the needs of society at a particular moment. Yeah, so whether, and that is the problem. I think the, a lot of the buildings that are here now were responding to needs from 50 years ago. And the needs have changed. Society has changed. You know, we have internet now. Mobility has changed. The way people educate has changed. So we are working on kind of updating uh, or upgrading our cities to, to be fit for that change, I think. And that is still uh, also permanent. Uh, up to a certain point, yeah, but it, it's permanent for, for the needs that are now. I think the, the difficult question is what are the future needs of this city? Where are we going to change towards? And I think that's something we deal with when we're teaching uh, to our students, because we're teaching students that are going to be you know, having their own offices in maybe 20 years from now. So what are, what, what are they going to be trained for? We, we don't train them anymore to just you know, design and endless offices and, and hotels and houses, because we are already doing all that, or, or you or maybe. Um, so what are we training them for? It's to understand the needs of society and to understand their role of an architect to, to build communities in a sustainable manner, I think. And part of that is creating or dealing with existing buildings. And part of that is dealing with arising needs, so to say. And, and I think, as an architect, that is your role. Your role is to serve society, uh, be a part of that society. It's not to um, build buildings for yourself. So your question is, do we like that as architects? I think it's a kind of wrong question. It's like, as a doctor, you know, do you like uh, to to work with people's hearts? Yeah, in a way, you like it because it's your job. But I mean, you rather not uh, have people being ill. Of course, you know, they would. You would love to have no need for your job. You would love to have that, 
but it's not like that. So until that point, we are here, at least so as I see it, to help uh, society be able to live in a, in a good, harmonious and equitable way. I would like to pick up on that one and maybe how the cities might change or have to change. And I think this is, again, relatively specific from country to country because, you know, I'm originally from Germany, I've been living in the Netherlands and so on and so forth. And uh, we were heavily affected by the, by the pandemic situation. So on the one hand side, um, you know, you have the social distancing measures and it works perfectly fine here in Singapore where I'm, where I'm currently. So all the rules are, are kept. Um, people are wearing masks and okay, it, it works. It's completely under control. But then if you take like other countries, like uh, let's take Germany, you know, it's not so much under control at the moment, um, but at least in this dips in these waves in between people who go out uh, and all these researches, um, you know, about public health and how far do you have to be outside? Uh, are you under the open sky? You have the light, you have uh, sort of the breeze. Um, being less dangerous, um, having a public life and having meaningful um, interaction with human, human beings is, is much better in the outdoors than it's in the indoors. And, um, on the other hand, like facilities like cinemas and so on and so forth, where indoor facilities where people were gathering on tight spaces. So maybe it's really a, a, a moment. And when I also look back, when, when cities developed in a certain way, um, very much under, under the, the, the premises or the perspective of hygiene, you know, and then we have, like you, you mentioned in the brief, the Garden City, for instance, that immediately evokes now uh, this image of, of, of Unger's uh, urban ar archipelago in, in Berlin. So what about if we have building structures which are not needed anymore because we cannot gather there and meet anymore in a, in a, in a healthy way, at least in these countries which are more affected? So why not taking density out of cities, you know, erasing a couple of them and providing much more greener zones and, and, and you know, making cities more healthy and, and giving it back to the, to the nature as a part, rather than, you know, trying to rethink what we do with the building substance, which is maybe not needed anymore. I mean, having also like the, the, the whole service industry growing of, you know, deliver, delivery. So the past year I was living at home, I didn't go out at all and everything we got delivered from, from, from the supermarket. So there's no need anymore really to go to the supermarket if the infrastructure is there. So maybe the life or the public life will happen much more on a, on a neighborhood level or in a local level rather than on a, on a city level. I, I think, um, of course, pandemic uh, is hurt for everybody in the world uh, but at the same time um, when we had situation I think everyone tried to uh, to use what what they have the best for instance um, we have the technology today right so which is we always we, we didn't uh, use much before so uh, when pandemic come, everyone tried just uh, to work from home. Only uh, move out when you need to, really need to. So therefore, I think in the future, people start to rethink, why should we make such a big office? Why should we make such a big, uh, for instance, of any, any, any facility, public facility? And, and then, if you don't build a lot, then you don't waste it. And then there is opportunity for others uh, to come. In Vietnam, for instance, like people try to build big, 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 I don't know, maybe the same in China. And then one pandemic comes, certain job, they okay, you can work from home. You only go out when you need to, really need to. And then um, I think positive, way out of rethink of entire society, entire urban, uh, will be changed in the positive way. That's how I see it. Picking up on the entire uh, thing, and Florian and I liked about, uh, was it about 15 minutes in, you said I want to provoke a bit. 
I'll attempt to do the thing with about our last 18 minutes here and pick up on a few topics. Uh, and the last one will probably get a reaction on the architecture question. First of all, I think in terms of COVID, I'm not very hopeful, to be really honest, uh, that it's going to cause a positive change. The thing I do think is hopeful, again, being from the United States and China is where I currently live, I, I really hope it's been a wake up to the world that we're all connected and we need to think more seriously, not just about our medical systems, but about the reality that we travel and uh, we can't keep uh, putting up walls in terms of our visas and, and all these sort of things. So that's one thing I'm hopeful for. I'm a little worried again. Yeah, you asked, I know, I know, I know. You're all shaking your head rightly. But I'm in, I'm in Singapore, it's crazy to get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. And we're all gonna put up walls even more like the Swiss have been doing for years and us Americans are the worst. Secondly, in terms of the post-capitalist, I would love to think we're gonna wake up on that. I totally disagree. And I like, uh, again, freaking Dutch guy, and I never remember his last name, <laughs> Rutger or whatever. Uh, who said it's all about taxes. I think it is about capitalism. If we w do want to get people to not tear down buildings, if we do want to solve gentrification, at least in some regard, but as Han said, it's not all bad. I, I'm totally with her on that. If we do want to think of these environmental things, it's all monetary structures. It is some form of capital. Maybe it's not capitalism. And then on the last thing, which always gets a reaction in these architecture things, my take on this, and I wrote it 10 years ago when I was in the Netherlands, uh, when we had the last supposed financial crisis on a book that said, what is the future of architecture? My take is the future of architecture is super important and it's about making buildings. And I think it's really great, and I'm an architect, uh, and it's really great uh, that architects are interested in larger systems and things like that. But I think it's really important just to design really nice, high quality buildings. Like you said, William, I do think we need to be more flexible. But I think the reality of what's going on, all these things we're talking about, they're actually not things that architects are primarily trained in. They're more led by urban planners, urban designers, landscape architects. When I think about the future of architecture, it's actually becoming a bit secondary and admitting that it's more object-based uh, to solve our problems. It's more of a series of systems and landscape and urban planning and, and urban studies or whatever you want to say as it's evolving has always been more system-based. Architecture has always been a bit more object-based and, and I think there's nothing wrong with architecture becoming a less important profession and allowing some of those others to be more dominant in terms of how we shape our landscapes and our cultural cities to make sure we kind of all move forward in the future uh, economically, uh, ecologically, and so on and so forth. That's my attempt to see if I can stir up. I say architecture is not that important. That usually gets someone to say architecture is everything. Who wants to pick <laughs> that one? Well, architecture is something. <laughs> I think uh, uh, we are architects, planners, we're, we're, we're about the, the uh, creation of space, I think, in, 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 a, in a very broad sense. So I guess now that we're in the middle of this crisis and we're trying to imagine what would the world and what would the cities like once the crisis is done, uh, we have to think about, okay, what is the space that we want to create when, when everything is said and done? And, and as mentioned earlier, for whom and for what? So, so this is an opportunity for us to really uh, see ourselves in, in, uh, in this sort of like a cusp in, in the development of society. Uh, real estate uh, is also in the, in the business of producing space. Now, what we have seen is that uh, pre-pandemic, we've seen how real estate can really get out of hand, wherein land is not just considered for its use value, but more importantly, and what has predominated uh, real estate is that it's used for exchange value. People are buying for speculative reasons and not for use. And that, that sort of created this very rapid uh, escalation of prices that has also eased out and marginalized several people from, from the cities. So, and then when pandemic came, all of a sudden, we have so much inventory, we produce so much space, and they're not for what's essential. So as uh, Denise mentioned, uh, th this is really a time for us to take stock and, 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 and see that 
okay, what is really essential? What is of value? And uh, maybe it's not the exchange value should, that should predominate the creation of space and the production of space and the creation of, of, of cities as we move forward. I would like to pick up on that bit of what you also said, Jason, and the systems thinking. I think this is, is now it's fundamentally right. And um, you know, one of my key learning points uh, when I was studying in the Netherlands is the value of landscape architecture, for instance, because you know, before what I learned when I was studying in Germany, it was more or less like you know the notion of decorating a city with trees, right? Uh, and uh, all of a sudden you go into this notion of the summative landscape. And I think um, architecture, like so many times before, and um, the need changed, technology changed, the mode of production changed, also needs to be there. And that means for, you know, focus differently. And I think uh, you're absolutely right with this uh, landscape architecture and, and, and the systems we set up, you know, the systems for water management, the systems maybe for biodiversity, um, uh, maybe growing food in the city. So architects need to learn how they can contribute in a way that the buildings are part of the system and not the object anymore. Right. So I very much agree. So I, I think it's like we need we need to change a lot of that sort of stuff. And what I also find it, uh, what I wanted to add earlier, I mean, I'm very much um, intrigued by this um, matrix. I don't know if you know this from um, Chipola, the intelligent, the helpless, the stupid, and the bandits. The four quadrants, right? And uh, you know, in Indonesia, at least, I think. Um, a lot of people are, are, are operating in a bandit sector. So they generate benefits for themselves and harm to others. And I think um, no matter, you know, I mean, the way how we operate with our office in a way, of course we need to make money. But I mean, how do you use part of this money? We try to do a lot of projects which are also helping uh, others. And uh, even though we have, we're working with CSR funds, for instance, from other companies, we try to, to, to find smart solutions or intelligent solutions, meaning like everybody has a, has a win. You know, and, and I think if, if we could move forward or progress, that people, no matter which background, have a similar understanding of a sort of a, a greater good in mind. So whatever they produce, not to have a harmful impact on others, but to produce really win-win-win situation. If everybody would like, would start to act more into this direction, I think, you know, we would solve all our problems instantaneously. I just want to oh, react to Jason's statement about uh, architects not being so important, but uh, I think one of the ways that we can really be important now, instead of looking out and out, and further and further at larger scales is really to look inside. Um, I think that's really important now and um, everyone's so aware of their interior environments and how that affects our well-being, our health. And I think architects can really have an impact here, not just um, you know, always looking outward um, at the macro scale. So looking at the scale of um, interiors at the micro level, of materials, of light, of, um, of, of uh, just all the elements that we put into our spaces, whether, you know, where we live, work, and play, um, so that we can really generate uh, spaces that are uh, productive, that are, that are also delightful and, and livable, right? I think we need to start at that scale before we then, we can create livable cities. So, I think that's where really architects now can focus all our, our skills and efforts and contribute. So um, it's time for us to like, um, you know, redesign, re re um, reinvent um, our interior spaces, especially those um, buildings that are maybe not used um, as much, but starting with our own spaces at home. Um, just to reiterate what most of you have said before, I think that takeaway here is that um, we architects are basically prophets. No, prophets in such a way that we learn, we have to learn to anticipate the needs of the people. Usually, the clients, some of the times the client won't even see those needs. So I think as architects, we have to be able to have that foresight to be able to identify what changes would happen uh, in our country on a macro level or in a micro level 
No? So echoing what most of you have also said, uh, flexibility of spaces are important because we can't really tell because I'm sure most of us have not designed for the pandemic before this happened. No? It was not in our, we were not thinking about design for the pandemic before. So last year, uh, this trend has just started uh, last year, right? So uh, I guess that's it. We have to learn to anticipate uh, the needs for the future. Before we wrap up, our, we have our last question. What do, you, what do you think will our cities look like in 2050? Jason? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Um, what will our cities look like in 2050? <laughs> I'm just going to skip that question and let the next person take it because I'll pick up on what Denise said, which I quite liked, as well as what. Uh, sorry, do I call you John Ernest Jose? Sorry, dude. Yeah, sure. I never know. Sure, you can go on. Full respect. I really like what Denise said about interiors. And what I'll bring up, uh, at least it was just, to be honest, it's a bit of an interesting anecdote. Uh, but here in Hong Kong, when the protests were happening, what was extremely interesting, because I was shocked uh, being here uh, to see the list of what do we do with these places that aren't so active anymore, and I saw malls on the list. In Hong Kong, malls are doing just fine, um, as always. But what was interesting that happened a year ago with the malls is when the protests happened, a lot of the protesters didn't want to do it in the streets. They did it in the malls that they knew that the mall security was on their side. But, and so the notion that we talked about before about flexibility or this kind of blur of public and private, I thought was just an interesting moment. I'm not going to predict what that means for 2050, but I certainly think in our discussions of capitalism and big government, that was a super intriguing moment and really real. That wasn't a one-off. A lot of our friends who were protesters were like, no, no, we don't want to do it in front of City Hall. We're going to the mall. Uh, it's way safer. Uh, the cops won't be allowed in. So that was intriguing. In terms of money, something I've always, and this is again, pretty much a non sequitur and really ignoring the question. Yeah, all of us architects, you know, we need money just like anyone else to survive in society. I think, Talking, again, we'll go back to Texas, Texas, Texas. I, I still think the way we bill is insane. Architects uh, are part of one of the biggest money-making industries on the planet, either large form government or uh, massive developers. And we charge uh, the same as the janitor, uh, basically, for a one-off installation fee. If we really want to be a part of changing things, we need to take part in risk. And that means we need to do our fees that we get rewarded if we do something that helps and we get punished if it doesn't work. Architects and architecture societies generally don't do this. Um, but I think if we're really serious about making a difference, we need to take risk in it. And then that will allow us to have more voice in these sort of things. But I think now we charge ourselves as a one-off designer fee. Um, and now someone else can pick up what do our cities look like in 2050 because I really skipped that one. Thank you for calling on me. Uh, no disrespect, but uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass. Matt. 2050. Very shortly. I think one thing we did not discuss is the overaging population. Here in Singapore, it's a very big issue. So probably we'll have a lot of ramps and travelators. Um, escalators. I mean, this is not meant ironically, but sort of as a as an image of how do we cater for this uh, overaging population, and it will hit me, and it will hit uh, a lot of other people. Uh, Indonesia, maybe uh, Philippines, not so much because you have a very narrow population. Um, yeah, the rising sea levels. I mean, we had it with the deltas. Um, you know, uh, we will have a massive problem there if the worst prognosis are happening then yeah, there will be a massive issue. And that means um, parts of the city are not as livable anymore or inhabitable. And it will cost a lot of money and not every country uh, can do that. Like Singapore, for instance, you know, to, to reinforce it, to make it maybe brute force. Um, yeah, so I mean, these are the two things I wanted to add to what was already said. I, I think uh, every country is different, but uh, I do agree with, with Farian that uh, in general, we have the population uh, we have to deal to, and we want to see a rise. 
and uh, but these two uh, and many others. But I think um, for me, even when you ask me tomorrow, I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> How can I say night uh, in a fifty? But I, I, I do think that, um, yeah, uh, my imagination, maybe Vietnam, uh, 50 level highs, uh, uh, urban agriculture, <laughs> and uh, maybe three, four, five uh, different level transportation. And then uh, that's my imagination, 2050. I want to add something to this point. First of all, I agree fully with Jason that you know the architecture is irrelevant in the end. You know, architects are irrelevant to uh, defining the future of a city, to the the, the problems we are facing uh, as societies at large. We are irrelevant uh, if we stick to just thinking that our goal is to make buildings. Yeah, if our, our architecture is a means, it's not a goal. So architecture is a part of going to this future in 2050 or in whatever year. And so having said that, you know, how our futures will be, I think Beijing in 30 years from now will be a really nice livable city because there's so much at stake here to make it that way. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, other cities in the world, like my, my hometown, or let's say Amsterdam, will be more and more unlivable because there's so much trouble, social, cultural, and economical troubles that are gonna be um, played out of there in, in this city. Yeah? But let's focus on what architects can do to get to 2050. Yeah. I think, uh, as, as Jason said, uh, we need to expand our horizon to the largest scale, meaning we should understand the environmental systems at play. That's why we, when we work in Holland, we work as landscape architects, master planners, architects, and interiors. It's just the two of us, I mean, our company, but we do that. Uh, and it's no problem because we can go from this larger level that Jason mentioned and to the smaller level that Denise is mentioning because they're all equally relevant to making livable cities. And uh, it should be a more of a bottom-up process. It should more start with that experience, that's, as she was saying just now, start with the experience of making our home livable, of making our neighborhood livable, and making the people around us uh, have a, a good working environment, have a good teaching environment, have a good living environment. And from there on, we can spread out and to make our cities more livable. And I think, I would hope, that that will be the future of our, for our cities in 2050, that it will be more livable because of a bottom-up, participatory, community-driven um, uh, development process. But I don't think that will be valid for all cities around the world, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Metro Manila in 2050, Quite honestly, it kind of scares me. <laughs> uh, if you look at, you know, because I've I've lived long enough, of course, to to remember what was what Man Metro Manila was thirty years ago. So that was just 1990, and uh, it was less crowded. We had uh, fewer buildings, less traffic, and now here we are, and we're trying to project thirty years forward. What what has changed uh, significantly? was, is, uh, as we all know, it's really technology. Uh, so the other main driving force that is uh, uh, necessitating the change or is creating the change is as also, as we all know, is uh, the environment and the climate. So uh, this, this COVID crisis sort of gave us a preview in rapid time of what the impact of a major global calamity would look like, which is, which is climate change. So I, 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 I echo what the uh, man said. You know, uh, I cannot really visualize what the future of the city would, would look like, but we do have aspirations. We do hope that, uh, for instance, this, this, uh, uh, what we have learned from this COVID crisis will, will teach us on how to make our cities respond better. 
And I also echo what, what Denise said, because what we're seeing is, it's really an issue of scale. Uh, the COVID crisis, the pandemic, and the, uh, the, the lockdowns showed us to look at and appreciate the city at a smaller scale. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, the notion of a 15 minute city became very popular and it's really about scale. So mobility as reach, things that you can reach by walking. All of a sudden, these are, are very important. So I, I really hope that by, by uh, you know, after this crisis, we, we know better, we know better. In 1990, uh, developers were building villages, gated communities that are in the hundreds of hectares. Why? Because that is what the market was looking for. Uh, single use enclaves, single markets catering to just one niche of the market in the hundreds of hectares. Now that's unthinkable, thank goodness. So, so maybe uh, uh, we're learning along the way, markets are being shaped and I hope that uh, this, this pandemic and this crisis has uh, educated all of us to, re to, to rethink the scale of our cities, the scale of our neighborhoods, to, now we cannot talk about inclusivity and equity without talking about scale. So we, we, we have to, uh, we, we really have to recalibrate our thinking about, about scale so that we can better respond or we can have a more responsive city in, uh, in 30 years, if not sooner. Thank you for joining Thank us, you everyone. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. All right, for our viewers, we'll be right back. Hope to see everyone here soon. Congrats. Congrats. Bye, guys. Next time in person again. In person, yeah? yeah. In person, in person. Jason. Jason, Thank man. You. Man. Martin, Gloria, and Joel. Denise. Nice. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 And to Miss Judith Bye. as well. Thank yes. you. Thank you.